Yeah, I'm muted now, are you? We are unmuted. Are you going to control the mouse in or? Uh, I'll just do it while we're okay. still admitting people once that's done. And Good morning, everyone. Your guest host today is me, Craig. Great. And I feel like I'm uh, Ken Jennings filling in for uh, Alex Trebek, but. Uh, Kyle's not dead. Though. Kyle's not dead, though. <laughs> Thank heavens. <laughs> Uh, today we're going to try to get into uh, try to cover rules one and two, uh, and if we have time, we'll do a rules quiz uh, following that. So it's going to be kind of boring. It can be a lot of a lot of definitions covered, but these are as as Kyle mentioned last week. Definitions are a very important part of helping you make a rules de decision while you're out there as a volunteer. So uh, it's good that we cover them now. During, during the course of these sessions. So the uh, first rule is, uh, rule number one, is the game, player, conduct, and rules. And uh, the purpose of the rule, of course, is to, with the underlying principle is you play the course as you find it and play the ball as it lies. Very, very important part, and you'll, you'll hear that uh, very often throughout the different uh, parts of, the, uh, of each rule. Um, 1.1 1 .1 is, is the game of golf, and it's defined, golf is a round, it, defined, it defines a round. A round can be defined as 18 holes or fewer, and we have, we have some tournaments where we have uh, uh, less than 18 holes, and, you, and the committee can um, change the number of holes if at the start of the tournament we've got some bad conditions out there on the course. We could change the uh, the competition to be less than 18 holes, but it's never going to be more than 18 holes. If you've got a, a situation where it's more than 18 holes, it's going to be two distinct separate rounds. Uh, however, now match play is an extension of the of the of the mat, of the round, so in a, in a sense, it does cover more than 18 holes. But that's that'll be more defined under match play when we get into our rule number. I guess rule number three talks about the difference between stroke play and match play. So you play the course as you find it and you play the ball as it lies. Rule 1.2 talks about the player's code of conduct and it talks about what each player is expected to do Interesting that they're, they're supposed to know the rules. Players are expected to know the rules and are expected to apply the rules when they have a breach of the rules. We obviously we know that that's not always the case and we have situations where players are coming into the scoring area where they may have committed a breach of the rule and they're gonna be penalized after their play. Uh, one thing it talks about in 1.2, it's kind of important is that normally last year under the old, or two years ago under the old format, under the, under the old rules, there was no discretion for a code of conduct. The code of conduct penalty was disqualification. However, under today's rules, a committee is allowed to um, develop a lower, um, a, a local, local rule as part of a code of conduct and we have, uh, we have developed, GAM has developed a, uh, a code of conduct policy and it's on, it's on our hard, it's on the, uh, it's referenced on our hard card. And as a volunteer, when you work a tournament each day, each day you'll have a packet given to you. And on the front of that packet, there is a notice to the players, which that's the sheet that has the uh, hole by hole locations for each hole. It also lists all the various local rules that are in effect for that day. Um, it is very important that as volunteers and as rules officials, you read over that notice to players so that you are familiar with the conditions that we are playing that day. It will mention things like uh, Things that are, that are not normally part of the uh, the, uh, the USGA rules, but that but are allowed. For example, always we will have 
ignore all course ball drops. But however, some, in some tournaments, we will allow ball drops on certain holes. So you need to be aware of when those situations exist. It talks about, uh, we'll talk about playoff, how many spots are, are gonna be taken and how many, and how many alternates. Um, it talks about different situations on the course. It may talk about uh, integral objects versus immovable obstructions out there under, under certain holes. And generally, it's, it'll, it'll tell you the uh, format and it'll tell you what tees to play from. So it's always interesting to get a, you're on the radio and you'll get these calls in from volunteers and they'll ask questions. It kind of reveals to everyone that they must not have read the notice to players very thoroughly because the information they're requesting has been covered under your notice to players. So try to, you know, take, take some special time and go through that notice of players, read it, and see if you're, see if the hole you are assigned to or the, the nine you are, if you're a rover, the nine you're assigned to, if there are situations on that notice that you need to be especially aware of, okay? Any questions on what might be uh, included on, on that notice of players? Anybody have a question? I think you can, um, I think everybody's muted. So if, I, if you have to, I think you have to uh, indicate you have to chat. And I have to unmute you if you want to chat. <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned also as part of the packet as a volunteer, you are going to have always in that packet is going to be the conditions of competitions, which is the GAM hard card. And I mentioned the code of conduct. Uh, that is, there is a, uh, someone chatting? Oh, okay. The, uh, about a third of the page down, there's a, a paragraph, or just a, actually a sentence, it talks about code of conduct and says, see the GAM player code of conduct and committee procedures, page, or procedure 5H. And you can find that on page 415 of the big book. If you want to, if you want to go there, we can look at that. And also the, uh, the GAM has, as part of the registration process for all the players, they have to acknowledge a code of conduct when they register. There is a, there is a list of uh, act, act, actions that players uh, are not allowed to take uh, that would be in violation of the GAM player code of conduct. But the 5H code of conduct policy allows the GAM to impose penalties other than disqualification. Uh, it may start out as a warning. Uh, it may it may jump right to disqualification based on the kind of uh, um, action that a player takes. For example, if a, if a player takes a, a swing at a, a rules official or throws a throws a club at at the rule, a rule official, I would uh, I can well envision that that player would be walked off the course immediately. Um, for people that were up at Boyne last year. Uh, you may, you, pay, you, you will never forget the second day of stroke play we had where the um, conditions were terrible, uh, not only for the players, but as well as the rules officials. It was rainy, windy in the latter part of the day for the, for the afternoon wave, especially. Uh, and the player, there were several, several players acknowledged that uh, but the, player, the play was not ideal. And some went so far as to act uh, in violation of our code of conduct. And uh, I, I, I would say that uh, we could have handled the situation better with this one player, especially. And the, uh, what, what I want to emphasize is that uh, when you, when we have, when we see a player, when you see a player that is in, that you, that you question their conduct, that, that it, it brought to the attention of the official in charge, the GAM official in charge, so that everyone else that is working that tournament is aware of the situation, is aware of the player, so that we uh, kind of track that player and see and and um, make sure that the uh, the his actions do not escalate uh, in in a bad way. Um, but uh, it eventually was um, 
the player did complete his round, um, but he wasn't, uh, he, he expressed uh, some, some uh, hostility towards several rules officials that, and that we probably shouldn't have let it get as far as we did. And uh, it's probably a failure that we did not communicate more properly during that round uh, for what was taking place with that particular player. Just, just a word of advice and just, just a note that we, uh, you know, we, we need to be aware of, uh, especially when, when the situation, when play is, uh, is not ideal for, for potential that players will act, you know, act out in that way. Okay. So take it, take a look at that, uh, Milo penalty structure, player code of conduct in 5-H. Um, now you, you wouldn't impose these penalties on your own. It would have to be uh, in, in conjunction with a lot of discussion, conversation with the official in charge and the other, other rules officials that are, that are working that tournament and to get, get some confirmation on what, uh, what's been taking place you know, prior to, uh, for that player. Any questions about the GAM uh, code of conduct? Hey, hey, Craig. Uh, Kyle, you want to take over? You see you there. We can't do this at home. <laughs> I I just want to echo what you said and, and said that um, you know it, exactly what you said is important in terms of um, everyone communicating to the official in charge and the rover. You know, we're not going to ask you as as rules referees to enforce code of conduct. That 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 that, that will be something that either the official in charge or the rover does, but, but we do need to know what's going on. And then I know, um, you know, a lot of you do a good job of this, but when, when, when stuff does happen, just making sure, like Craig said, that it's communicated out so that everyone knows that player X threw his club on hole three and that we gave him a warning. And if he does it again, you know, he's going to get a penalty or, you know, whatever the, the penalty structure is. So it's just, just as Craig said, it's really important to just let, um, people know what, what, what happened and, you know, we're never going to ask you to be the bad person. Um, but, but we need to know what happened so we can address it in, in a timely manner. Thanks Kyle. Uh, uh, yeah. This, this just come familiar. Can you hear me? But, um, go ahead. Pardon me. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I had one comment from also service on the championship committee. Uh, and that is, I think code of conduct violations are serious matters. I think they deserve sanction. Uh, but I think that sanction should be applied by a group of people, not by one person. In other words, not, not just by the RO on the golf course or even, frankly, some smaller group of the championship committee. I think the championship committee should review those things because that helps us fulfill the requirements of due process that I think are right and good and sometimes are even a requirement of the law. Uh, and there seems to be a, an historical reluctance about sharing the facts of misconduct penalties with the entire championship committee. And, and I think it not only should be shared with them, I think it should be shared with this committee so that we have some idea of what the application of policies and practices really are. I know that's not a popular position, but it's one that I maintain strongly and I wanted to voice it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, John. Appreciate it. Yeah, there are some examples in the book about code of conduct violations in your, in your uh, interpretations for 12A slash one, you should read through those uh, as well as become familiar with on the uh, player registration, the uh, some examples that the GAM has put together as well for uh, Code of conduct violations. So 1.3 playing by the rules means that the players are responsible for complying with the terms of the competition. Uh, we talked about those on our notice and our conditions. And there is a uh, there is a full set of uh, local rules that we also have that apply, we have, for example, we apply local rules and those are gonna be listed on the hard card that we maintain throughout the year. For example, back on the line relief, we allow that new local rule that if the ball bounces forward a couple inches uh, closer to the hole than from your relief point, uh, the player can play that ball and not be in breach of playing from the wrong place. So um, those local rules are 
are included in our, in our hard card or in some cases would be on the notice uh, to competitors for that particular day. So in, in applying the rules, the players are expected to recognize when they've breached the rule um, and applying their own penalties. Now, if a player or players knowingly breach a rule and knowingly disregard a rule, uh, the subject to that is going to be a disqualification. Even if they, uh, for example, if they, even if they, uh, if they agree to breach a rule or uh, ignore a rule prior to the start of their round, that is going to be also a disqualification situation, even if they have not yet acted on that, uh, that situation that they've agreed to breach. Once they've started their round and that, that agreement to breach a rule is in effect, as far as the players are aware, then that's going to be disqualification. For example, if they if players agree to give up, if they're going to give all putts under like two feet or something, and if they start their round under that uh, under that consent, um, that's going to be disqualification. Even in, even if they get to the first hole and one of the players changes uh, changes his or her mind and says, I don't think we should, you know, I don't think we should agree to that. Uh, at that point, it, it's too late. They've already bre uh, knowingly breached the rule to start of the round and they're gonna be disqualified for that. I'm not aware of anything ever happening like that. Hopefully we never have that ha situation happening. Uh, 13B2 talks about accepting players' reasonable judgment, uh, which means as a rule, rules official, you're gonna be out there and you're gonna be helping players and you're gonna be helping them find uh, points where they lost, last crossed the edge of a penalty area. Uh, you're gonna be helping them in other situations where you you yourself may not be have specific knowledge on where that relief area should uh, should be. Um, so you're gonna, you are going to have to rely on the player's reasonable judgment in determining that location and applying the rule. Now, um, I would suggest that before you talk, before you accept just the player's word on that, that you should also get consent from uh, the other players in that, in, that, in that group. You want them to um, agree to where that player is telling you where that estimated point is for example where that ball last crossed the edge of a penalty area, or that, or that, or where they, um, where you should be taking relief from, or where the ball should be replaced in its original spot in case it needs to be replaced. So if the players come to a reasonable uh, agreement on where that should be, then I think you should, you know, you should accept that and not, not, uh, and you've, you know, you've covered your bases on that, and you should uh, go ahead and allow that to happen. Everybody all set on that? Any questions? Hey, Craig. The, the other thing, too, is even a spectator may have a better view of a ball crossing a penalty area and using that along with the player to determine that uh, that spot where it last crossed the margin of the penalty area. That's a good point, Dan. Yeah. Player uh, spectators can also help. Um, you know, in a, in a case also where you've got a, uh, a situation or players can identify a ball, the spectator can be used if, if the spectator knows for certain that a ball can be um, identified, then that spectator, if the spectator approaches you and tells you that he knows exactly, you know, which ball is which, for example, in junior tournaments, you get two players with, without marking a ball and are playing uh, the same type ball, say ball number, um, a spectator can determine which ball is which if, if, he, if, he, if a spectator tells a rules official, which, which is which, you can, you can accept that. So spectators are a good resource. The 1.3C talks about the penalty structure, um, talks about actions. Another person, penalty also applies when a player instructs another person to take an action that is in breach of the rule. And if, if that person is acting under the player's authority, uh, certainly that player is gonna be penalized. You, that's, that's certainly a violation of the rule. The same, the same 
uh, situation, uh, the same penalty would be applied to the player if the player observes somebody else taking an action that he knows would be a breach of the rule, that player is not going to be absolved. If the player normally allows that to happen, the player uh, needs to take reasonable steps to stop that from happening. Otherwise, that player would be penalized. Okay, the levels of penalty, you know, one stroke penalty, general penalty, or in match play, it's loss of hole, uh, two stroke penalty in uh, match play, and then dis disqualification. So now there are disqualifications in both match play and stroke play for certain rules breaches. And those cannot be, there's no discretion by the committee to vary those committees, uh, those penalties. Uh, those penalties are the authority of the USGA and we uh, do not have the authority to change the level of penalty based on uh, certain types of actions. Uh, one, three, C, four, talks about applying penalties to multiple breaches of the rules. Uh, that is a very interesting and difficult uh, and co sometimes controversial um, situation. It's worth looking at in your big book on page 29. There's an interpretation as well, a new interpretation this year. I think it's new. 13C4. Um, so let's go through some of those examples. It's on page uh, 29 of your big book. How you apply penalties to multiple breaches of the rules. If, if that breach occurs multiple times um, without an intervening event or, bef or, if, or if there's an intervening event occurs between the breaches. So if a breach it's also from unrelated acts. The player is going to get um, a penalty for each breach. And when a breach results from a single act of related acts, the penalty is going to get only one penalty, but the higher level penalty is going to be applied. Now, if you get multiple procedure penalty, multiple procedure breaches, for example, a player uh, lifts his ball without marking it and also cleans it, um, that's a multiple procedural penalty, but the player is only going to get one total penalty stroke. Uh, in stroke play, if a player uh, plays a substitute ball when not allowed and also plays that ball from a wrong place uh, under uh, in breach of rule 14.7a, that player is going to get a total of two penalty strokes. So in the... Um, I thought there were some examples in here. Okay. I, hey, Craig. Yeah, hey, Craig. I'm starting on page 30. Yeah, go ahead. So um, an example, I'm in a bunker. I ground my club. I pick it up. Then on my way back, I hit sand on my way back to take my, my stroke. Is that two penalties or is that one penalty? That's where this gets tricky. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, an argument could be made that it's that's a two separate acts that he could get he should get two separate penalties. I, I would argue for that. However, if the player is in a bunker, and he's taking multiple practice swings. Um, it's just one intervening action. You know, he could take three or four practice swings hitting the hit, you know touching the sand. Uh, that's probably going to be just one penalty, two penalty strokes for one, for you know multiple multiple breaches from a, a related act. You're going to get one penalty. However, on the other hand, if a player uh, is taking practice swing and hits it, uh, hits the sand, and then makes his stroke, and the ball remains in the bunker, walks over to the new location, takes another penalty stroke or another practice swing, and hits the sand in, in the, during the uh, practice stroke. Then, that, then that's going to be you know, a separate act with an intervening action between, and the player would get two, uh, two separate two-stroke penalties. General so, penalties, okay. Say, walking back to do something, um, 
rounding the club and then going back and doing something else, then taking a practice swing and, and hitting the sand, I would argue for two to uh, penalties and, and two separate two stroke penalties. That's what I would argue for. Thank you. That helps me to, that helps to clear it out for me. Hey, Craig. Yeah. When you're talking about intervening, your suggestion of a player in the bunker, how about if a player is in the bunker and takes a couple of practice swings hitting the sand and then before he makes a stroke, doesn't like the lie of his ball and actually moves it as a separate act, but there's no intervening quote stroke, I would suggest that that's two penalties there. Yeah, that would probably be under, um, probably, it looks like one three C four slash three. It's probably an unrelated act. So unrelated acts in the context of this rule are acts of the player, are acts of the player that are of a different type. So, and it gives examples of unrelated acts. And in those cases, um, talks about where you'd get multiple penalties. So there's two, there's a section, uh, there's a first section of that talks about unrelated acts where multiple penalty penalties apply. Um, so like taking multiple practice swings that touch the sand and then bending an overhanging branch, which, you know, it's a, affecting, the, it's a casket situation where your uh, conditions that affect the stroke. So you're, it's two unrelated acts. So you'd get two, separate penalty strokes for that situation. Now, if in, the, in, the, in the slash three uh, in interpretation, examples of related acts where only one penalty applies uh, are several practice swings that we talked about or asking for two different pieces of advice, such as what the player use and what wind direction is. Both are related to the process selecting which club, so they, they would be two different pieces of advice, but only one penalty stroke would apply in that case. But uh, Dr. Hicks, in your case, I would say it suggests that that's two uh, unrelated acts. So you, the player would get two, uh, two separate penalty, two separate two stroke penalties. Uh, so you should read through what the USGA has put together in pages 30 and 31, talk about intervening events between breaches resulting in different kinds of penalties where you um, would get two um, would get two different penalties or you've get a multiple breaches from a single act which would result in a single penalty in uh, interpretation slash two. Just I want you to be aware that those are there and uh, you know become familiar with how to apply that and and there again these these kinds of situations you would not want to probably do on your own. You would want to talk to the OIC or you bring your rover in and even the rover would want to talk to the OIC before you settled on uh, a rule, a final rule situation to apply. You would probably want to tell the player immediately that there's a problem and he's going to be subject to penalty. Um, but you have to probably tell that player that uh, uh, we're going to, he, we're still in the process of assessing the total amount of damage <laughs> that he's going to be in uh, penalties that occurred. Any more questions on 1.3, uh, 4? Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Craig, what are the things that you mentioned about where a player takes several practice swings in the bunker and then going backwards, he touches his hand? That is this one penalty. It's related acts. It is a related act, Marv? Yeah, it is related acts. Okay. You, did you find that in the, in the book somewhere or? Uh... Yeah, as a matter of fact, if you go into interpretations uh, where it says examples of related acts where one penalty applies include making several practice swings, touch sand in the bunker. Uh, but then if he goes back and takes it back on, the, on the back on his line, touch the sand, it's part of the same thing. Okay, thanks Marv. Like I said, these are, uh, these are things that need to be researched and looked at very carefully. Um, and a lot of discussion would have to take place for the committee to agree upon you know, how, to, how to finalize that penalty. Hey, Craig. Yeah. Um, they're, 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 uh, one of the things in, in 1-3, and uh, you, you mentioned it as well, is that you know, players are, are, are responsible for breaches. Um, 
not only themselves, but also their caddies. And uh, I'm going to send a, a link here in the chat for everyone. But last last uh, year at the USAM, there was a pretty high profile caddy breach. Uh, and for those of you that watched it, it was uh, pretty, pretty incredible what happened watching it live. And um, but anyways, uh, there's a link there in the chat that talks about what happened. And um, if you watch it all, you, 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 you know what I'm talking about. And um, if you watch it, you probably know that the, that the player handled it, handled it like a pro, not a little college kid. Um, it's, but, in the, it's in the chat area now? Yeah, yep, yeah, I think so. Okay, I'm bringing it up now, thanks. So it's, uh, it, you know, you, you don't have to look at it now, but just something to look at. It was uh, kind of one of these things where we get a, a nice, uh, kind of rules rules and action type thing where we can see. But I mean, I think everyone knows that, um, you know, caddies, that players are responsible for what their caddies do. Um, in this case, you know, this caddy might've cost the player a chance to play in the, um, you know, USAM final. So- Yeah, we're bringing, it, we're, we're bringing it up now, Kyle, thanks. Since you brought it up, we may as well, it's a good, it's a good point. We're gonna play it. Everybody see that uh, picture on, the, on your screen? I don't see it. No. no. This is this is Lynn. Sorry, I was late. Uh, no, I don't see a picture. Oh, yep, there's something. You see a caddy now? Yes. I see it. Okay, we're gonna. You see that? stop this yeah so the um Craig, what happened? I'll, well, go ahead, Kyle. I'll i'll keep talking while, while you while you get it sorted out so basically what 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 happened was the, the uh the, i think it was on the 18th hole and the player hit hit the ball in the bunker and, uh, the caddy went up there without really permission from the player so to speak he just went and felt the sand there and um you know it happened on on national tv so they 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 had to question it and then obviously I mean, when they when they questioned the caddy you know why he was doing it he said well he was just he was just trying to feel how how soft the, or how hard the sand was and um you know obviously that that's a penalty if, honestly or really you know no matter what he would have said he, he would have got penalized for it um but it's, it was just a, an unfortunate situation because the player didn't really ask the caddy to do it. Um, the caddy just went and did it. The, the other thing that is not really rules related, but kind of per, you know personal story related, is that the uh, caddy was a club caddy, and the guy did not know him at all. Um, so it's kind of rough that in the I think it was in the semifinals of the uh, Michigan or the uh, a USAM that some guy you met when you got there cost you potentially a chance to get there. So. But the guy, the um, uh, Segundo, um, yeah, he he handled it very well, and you know, def definitely better than I than I would have. That's for sure. Uh, this John Allen, I'll add one more too. At uh, a senior amateur national championship uh, years ago, where can you hear me? Okay, I got somebody else talking. That's all. Uh, 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 at a senior amateur national championship a few years ago where I was an RO, uh, a young high school woman, a local caddy, walked up to a green in the second round of medal play and rubbed the green with her hand. 
but it of course did the player absolutely no benefit whatsoever but the player himself immediately reported it and took a two-shot penalty which in a national championship of course is usually the equivalent of death for qualification for match play so uh uh, I, players are honest about this stuff. They, uh, they, they, they fess up very readily. They follow the example of Mr. Jones. And I thought that incident on TV, although it was most unfortunate for the player, was really a great example to golfers and particularly young golfers uh, out there. Um, I'm having a hard time hearing people on a, on a Zoom call, so I'd... Um... We all set to move on now. I appreciate the feedback. Thanks for the input, Kyle and John. Any questions for what they were talking about? No, we're all good, Craig. Go ahead. Okay. So any, any other questions about rule one before we move on to rule number two? Okay, rule two talks about the, well, the purpose of the rule is to talk about the, uh, the basic things every player should know about the course Talks, it it uh, goes into the definition of the five, of the five defined areas of the course. Bring that up. And it's important to know that where, where the ball lies in terms of the status uh, that's going to affect how ruling, rulings will be made in terms of the various objects and conditions that, that will affect the player in in that part of the course. Um, there are five areas of the, of the course that I mentioned. The first area is it called the general area. It's general because that's every other area besides the uh, four specific areas of the course. And the four specific areas of the course, um, well, the, the general area covers all the, most of the course, where the player's ball will be most often played uh, until it reaches the putting green. So it includes every type of ground and growing or attached objects found in that area, such as fairway, rough, and trees. Okay. So four specific areas of the course are the teen area, where the player starts the hole from, the uh, penalty area, all, pen all penalty areas, all bunkers, and the putting green of the hole that the player is playing. So in other words, a wrong green is considered part of the general area and not part of the putting, you know, not, not a specific part of the course for that player on that hole. If a, a, a ball can only, and there's a diagram of the, uh, of the course and it lays out the uh, general area, versus the, sport, the four specific parts of the course. The, uh, air, a ball can only be in one part of the course. If it's, if it's, if the part of the ball is in the general area and one of the four specific areas, the ball is gonna be treated as lying in that specific area. And if it's lying in two specific areas of the course, it's gonna be treated in the order of this, in this, in this order, uh, penalty area, then bunker, then putting green. Um, and I want to talk about definitions of those three areas, okay, including teen area. Let, so in the definitions, I want to talk about teen area first. In the teen area, you know, Teen area is that specific part of the course that is defined by where the ball, the, the ball markers, the, the T markers are placed. Okay. Um, t, uh, I'm, it's called teen area, I'm sorry. Teen area is the, def is the definition. So it's where the player starts this hole from. It's a rectangle. It, it is a two club length area starting from the very frontmost portion of the T marker, extending back two club lengths, and from the very outermost edges of the T markers, it's, it's that rectangle. So it's, when you hear the T, T area discussed, it's only that 
It is not the entire tee pad or any other tee pad. If you've got, you've got a, if you're, if we're playing from the black tee markers and white tee markers for two sets of kinds of players, a player that starts from the black tee marker, that is his only teen area. The white teen area is part of the general area of the course for that player. Uh, there, there are some unique situations now in the new rules where if a ball ends up in the teen area after the players, you know, tease the ball up, there are some special considerations that a player may do, but the ball must lie in the teen area. Uh, and we talk about club length. There's a definition of club length too. It extends from the very toe to the end of the butt of the club, I guess I'll call it, to the, uh, to the hand of the part of the club. And there's, I think someone brought up the situation or the discussion last week about uh, club length. You know, we use club lengths a lot for determining relief. And we, we also use it in determining the area of the teen area. Now, there's, we often hear rules officials tell players to take the head cover off when they are measuring their relief area. Um, and I'm not, I'm, I'm suggesting that is, that, is that true or not? I'm, I'm opening that up for some discussion on the definition of uh, how we determine club length and how we would, we, would we, would we require a player to take off a head cover before measuring uh, a club length for relief? Any, any comments or questions on that? I don't, there's a, if you go to club length and look at the um, interpretation of club length and your definition is an interpretation of that. And it talks about the head cover is not considered part of the length, nor is any attachment to the handle of the club. Um, but is it, is it a requirement that the player take off the head cover to measure uh, club length in, in determining relief? Anybody comment? Uh, Some places. Can you, can you hear me? Go ahead. Uh, I see you one and raise you one. Uh, not only do I think he doesn't need to take off the head cover, he doesn't even need to lay the club down on the ground anymore. I think if you look at rule 1.3b2 and committee procedure uh, 6c7, uh, it says the player can estimate all these distances. And so long as that estimate is made in good faith, the player gets the benefit of the doubt. I think that was a key concept in the 2019 changes to do away with all this delay by geometry and fooling around sticking T's in the ground and then arguing about whether he's an inch off or not. Uh, I think all most people have to do with the length of their driver is take one very good large step in the right direction and determine the relief area that way. And I think we should do that more often. It would speed play greatly and there is no significant advantage gained in virtually every circumstance with this. That's why I think the 2019 rules and why the committee procedures have that provision. And unfortunately, I think it's the one that's been most ignored uh, in the changes that were adopted. We're still doing it the old way and I don't think we need to. Uh, any other discussion on that? Any, any, any other viewpoints? Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, one thing in a club length says in the definition is always the longest club in the player's bag. Oftentimes, some of our officials give the wrong information in relief for normal course condition, and they say it's one club length. It's not. It's finding the nearest point to where the ball lies plus one club length, which is the longest club in the bag. And if it doesn't follow the procedure, the players could be a problem of playing from a wrong place. So we need to be specific about how to take that relief. Uh, you're right, Marv. It's one. It's the uh, longest club in your bag, excluding the putter. But you're right in determining in determining in the situation where you're determining the nearest point of relief, the player should use use the club that he or she intends to use for their next stroke in right. determining that nearest point of relief. And once that nearest point of relief is determined, then your relief area is one additional club length. In, you know, in a, in a semi-circle fashion or at that, at that nearest point, no closer to the hole. But John, 
That's right. It's Great. not a requirement. And we should try to get, get away from having players lay their clubs on all the time, especially in situations where, they, where, they don't, where you don't anticipate them using the full club length, length measure out. Um, if, they're, if they're well within a club length, uh, I would, if you're watching and observing a player take a relief and they're well within a club length, there's no point in asking that player to get out the club length and lay it down on the ground. Just let them proceed. Um, now, if you've got a player, however, is trying to stretch out that maximum length, uh, you've got to be careful there. I think you'd want to be careful to make sure they don't um, abuse that club length uh, definition. Craig? Yeah. Going back to your original point, when measuring on page 332, it's very specific that the club, that the head cover should be removed. Right in the middle, club length slash one, meaning of club length when measuring. Why don't you read that for us, Dr. Hicks? It's a definition, well, we can bring it up. It says for the purpose of measuring when determining a relief area, the length of the entire club, starting at the toe of the club and ending at the butt end of the grip is used. However, if the club has a head cover on it or has an attachment to the end of the grip, neither is allowed to be used as part of the club when used using it to measure. Craig, this is a- Any comment on Bill. that? Anybody else have a comment on that? Yeah, Bill, Craig, this is Bill. It seems reasonable to me that that would be the way we'd want to proceed because it, uh, head covers, as we all know, come in different shapes and sizes and so forth. And I guess the question is at what point if you leave a head cover on, given its size and shape and so forth, does that give the player potentially a significant advantage in their next stroke? You know, in most cases, probably not. But I think to be consistent, uh, again, because of the different shape, sizes, and uh, uh, widths of these darn things, uh, it might be best just to remove, remove those. And certainly, uh, that's what it says in the book. And I think if we were to ask somebody from the USGA, that's exactly the answer they'd give us. Yeah, I, I, Greg, I'd, I'd kind of question uh, question that given, so just to take the other end of the club and uh, give you an example, uh, and some of you may be familiar with Arcos, but that's a attachment in the end of the club. And based on your interpretation of that, I would have to remove my Arcos extension um, from the club before I could use it versus what I think the rule, the definition is saying, and, and that is uh, to ignore it, do not use it as part of the length. But um, I, I don't think it's, I don't think the rule is, or the definition is saying that I need to remove that uh, extension on the grip to use it as, a, as my uh, measurement. I think I just have to ignore that part of the, of the club. Uh, this is John Allen. I have one further comment too, and that is, I think under the 2019 rules and under the official guide, it really is, in many cases, a mistake for the player to use a club to measure. And here's why. If you look at 1.3b2 on page 27 of the official guide, it's entitled Accepting Player's Reasonable Judgment in Determining a Location When Applying the Rules. Bullet one, many rules require a player to determine a spot, point, line, area, or other location, such as, second example, estimated, estimating or measuring when dropping or placing a ball in taking relief. And the third bullet says, so long as the player does what can reasonably be expected under the circumstances to make an accurate determination, the player's reasonable judgment will be accepted, even if after the stroke is made, the determination is shown to be wrong by video evidence or other information. So I think estimating is the better way to do it is my point from the player's point of view. And taking out clubs and measuring now is, I know we've done that forever. I know it's hard to break the habit and the tradition, but I think under the 2019 rules, as they were intended, and more importantly, as they're written, the player's better off estimating because that ends up being virtually a safe harbor, even if there's an error. So, okay, this is John. I, I don't agree with that position, right? The two club lengths is not something that you have to estimate. Where the ball went into a penalty area, 
250 yards away from you is something that you need to estimate. But as long as I've been studying the rules, there's never been a requirement that the player actually go through the measurement procedure. They only have to drop the ball in a place that is allowed if they did those measurements. So in most cases, we don't need to do anything if it's clear that they're dropping within the area, the, the relief area. Where it will get to be an issue is if somebody is looking to go to the edge of a relief area in order to get to get relief from some object that's in their way, a tree, go around, get, get into the fairway instead of the rough, those kind of things. In those cases, I think we should expect the players to measure when they're pushing the limit, especially because the ball now has to remain in the relief area after it's dropped. So right, the number of times that we need to require them to get out their clubs and do all these things is small, but in some cases, it's more important than it used to be. John, I appreciate that. I think I tend to agree with what you're saying. We should try to minimize the amount of time to require players to lay their club on the ground to, to determine the club length. If they're, if they're taking reasonable action and it doesn't look like um, they're um, exceeding the, uh, the length that they're allowed, then let's let them proceed. Um, and I tend to agree with Tony, the wording on that definition, the interpretation one, I don't think it requires the player to take the head cover off. Um, that's my interpretation in my humble opinion. Um, but I think we may do on some follow-up uh, on that with the USGA to see what they say. Uh, I don't think it's clear in that uh, interpretation of that. I think it's, I think it, the purpose is that it's defining the length and it does not include the head cover or any attachment to the, uh, to the grip. But I think you can still determine pretty much club length without taking that head cover off if, if, uh, if, it, if it comes down to that. Uh, we'll, well, we'll follow up on that and we'll, we'll see what the USDA has to say. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I really think the head cover has to come off if, it, if the club is used for measuring. That's one of the mistakes the player can make. And I, I can remember an old PGA Tour rules video when they used to be brave enough to publish players making mistakes under the rules. And one of them was Jack Nicholas when he had those pom-pom head covers that had a basketball on the hot top of them practically and he'd always try to measure his club lengths with the pom-pom head cover on and they said no you can't do that. Greg I think the other thing you got to be concerned about too is with the juniors you're, you're, you're still trying to help them to learn the rules and just by telling them take two steps and drop the ball that's not in the spirit of the game. They do talk about up to two club lengths so you need to be careful with that and know your audience on when you're going to do these types of things. Yeah, I mean, you're right. The juniors, uh, we have to give them as much help as, as possible. Sometimes they don't, they, they, they can use our assistance uh, for sure, Dan. Thanks. Greg? Yeah. I agree with Dan. I, I was going to bring the same thing up. Um, I think it's real important with the juniors, especially the younger kids, to uh, – teach them the rules as you go along. It might take a little time, but I think that's part of the teaching process. When you get into the college players and they, they, are, they already know the rules most of the time, then I think you can, you can skip some of that. But I think it's very important with the juniors. Okay, uh, moving along now to another definition. Each of these specific areas have their own rules. So we're not gonna go into any great detail, but I wanna cover the definitions of them. The uh, first one we're going to talk about is penalty area, where relief uh, is allowed with the one penalty stroke attached to it. Uh, this is an area where we must be virtually certain that the ball is in there in order to uh, provide relief under, under this rule, under rule, um, rule 17. The, uh, but if you look at the definition of a penalty area, it's, it's any body of water, whether, whether or not marked by the course. So if a is not marked and there's a body of water there, then by definition, that's going to be a, red, a penalty area. Um, but if you look at the definition, it includes areas like uh, things we may not think about normally, but like a ditch or a surface drainage ditch or other open water course, even if it's not containing water, by definition, it's going to be defined as a penalty area. Uh, we have two types of penalty areas, as you know, yellow and red. 
And uh, when we and GAM, we I, I'm pretty much pretty sure we always use stakes and lines to identify, don't we? Always. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we always use stakes and lines. Stakes are used to identify. Not and the line is defines the uh, the penalty area. It would be the outermost portion of that line, uh, say next to the next specific area, whether it be a uh, or, or or the general area. But if if, if a ball is in if, if a if a ball is touching or if a, it overhanging a red penalty line, that ball is to be considered in the in the penalty area uh, because the boundary line of a penalty area extends both upwards and downwards. Uh, and the same is true for yellow, yellow penalty area. And, and as I mentioned, if a color, if a penalty area has not been defined by a color, it's going to be a red penalty area. Any questions on penalty areas? You'll notice that sometimes uh, the high schools, people in high school tournaments, they, uh, the course has not been defined at all with penalty areas and you, uh, you'll need to discuss penalty areas with your uh, site manager to the areas are properly defined uh, before, we, before play starts and, and that gets communicated properly to the players because there's a, uh, High school, high school golf is uh, kind of a different, different world in terms of defining uh, the course and defining the boundaries on penalty areas. Uh, the next area to the, the next definition we want to talk about is bunkers. And a bunker is a uh, specially prepared area of sand. Um, where turf or soil has been removed. And so there are some items that are not part of a bunker. Any, and it defines those, those items to be a lip, wall, or face at the edge of a prepared area, consisting of soil, grass, or stacked turf or artificial materials. Those are not part of the bunker, nor are any soil or growing or attached natural objects within the area, within the edge of a prepared areas such as grass, bushes, or trees are not part of the, uh, of the bunker. In today's definition, or in, in the current rules, bunkers are not, have not been defined to uh, boundary extending upwards or downwards. Um, so I, I guess, I know they don't extend upwards, I guess, I guess I'm not too worried about them extending downwards, but they haven't been defined as extending upwards. So they are not, if, for example, if a ball is in a bunker and you've got a piece of soil or grass that hangs over the bunker, um, or, or say the ball is on that portion of grass overhanging the bunker, the ball is, is not in the bunker as, as definition. The, ball, the boundary of a bunker does not extend upward. So it talks about other areas that are not part of a bunker. It's, Sand that's spilled over. Um, and the committee can define a prepared area of sand to be not a bunker. If, if there is a bunker under construction or in, uh, um, in under construction, that, that entire bunker would be defined to be out of play or at an abnormal ground condition. It would not be considered a bunker anymore. It, it would have to be listed on our notice to competitors that that bunker is taken out of play as a bunker. So bunkers are fairly straightforward. There are certain, you know, again, there's a different rule for that. Bunker rule 12, I think it is. Um, I don't know my rule numbers as well as Lee, Lee Jewell because he talks about these uh, these rules that have the same numbers, the same wording that ends and starts a, a rule. Lee's got Mike, Mike uh, Church's flashcards. He's been using those all, all, all winter long. Okay, the next definition is putting green. I wanna cover that briefly. That's covered by rule 13. But briefly, it's a, 
especially prepared area for putting. Um, and it contains a hole in which the player tries to put the ball. It's part of the part of a specific area of the course. Uh, we de generally do not have a problem in determining the edge of a putting green. Uh, we have seen some courses where that becomes uh, somewhat difficult. And in, in such case, I think we've put down dots uh, at, around that edge of putting green to define the edge. And a putting green uh, does not, edge of the putting green does not extend upward. Uh, in order for a ball to be considered to be on the putting green, it must be, must be touching the putting green and not just overhanging the putting green. Uh, in some cases in GM, we've got a double green is used for two different holes. That's, it's, it happens on occasion. Um, the entire area of the prepared is an area for both holes is treated as a putting green when playing each hole unless such, unless such where GAM were to mark an area of the uh, putting green and they would define part of it to be uh, a wrong green for one hole and a wrong green for the other hole. And I, I think I think we do do that in some cases, don't we? Where we've got, yeah. For example, Stoughton Bray has a couple of greens in that case where we would mark mark that portion of a green in half and define the half that is not used for that, say for hole 12, the, the hole used for hole five, uh, we would mark that whole whole uh, that portion of hole for hole five to be the wrong putting green um, for hole number 12. And then you'd have to find, you'd have to find the nearest point of relief uh, following the guidelines for nearest point of relief for wrong, for wrong green. Any questions on putting green definition? Can we go back to penalty area real quick? Sure. Um, I have a picture here. I had actually shown it to Kyle and I think it's kind of a cool example. Um, can you see this? Uh huh. So at the bottom is a cart path and then the whole top of the curb is painted red. And then to the left is the penalty area going into water. And so the question was if the ball is on the cart path touching the, um, the curb that's painted red, then is it considered in the penalty area? We have another picture, or I'm standing on top of it. You get in, it's water all next to that cart path? The cart yes. path is water? Yes. That's all goes, you know, it goes down into the water there. So that's all painted red. So everywhere from the cart path or to the top of the curb to the water is considered, considered penalty area. Well, if we, in the case where we have a bridge that goes over a penalty area, the, well, this the isn't penalty a bridge, area extends. This is a cart path. Okay, but I know that's a cart path, right? Um, but in the case of the cart, the cart path is an obstruction, uh, similar to that a bridge would be. Now, if that were, I would I would say the same thing would apply. I mean, how would how did the committee mark that cart path? I would think they would mark that to be part of overhanging the penalty area. In, in which case, you would not get relief from that cart path. Exactly. Obstruction within the cart, uh, the penalty area. That's what I thought. Any part of the ball that touches a red line is considered in the penalty area or yellow line. And so even though the red line is above, because the penalty area goes above and above, it is touching the curb, then it would be part of the penalty area if the ball was touching it. Correct. I would imagine that if you went back to the edges of that cart path where it started and where it ended, where that penalty line penalty area is lined, you would see a red line going all the way across where that cart path is, or arrow extending across it, meaning that the cart path, the penalty area, that that cart path is part of the penalty area, an obstruction within it, which would not allow you to, to provide, to get relief. Well, the question is, is the cart path parallel to the penalty area, or is the cart path crossing the penalty area? It's parallel. The photos don't tell us that. It's, it's parallel. parallel. Therefore, therefore, it's not in the penalty area. Well, it's parallel to the, Even it's if parallel the ball to the... touches the curb? I'm just saying the cart it's path is not in the penalty area. It's, oh, okay. No, it's not. I, it's, I, mis I misinterpreted that. But if, if the ball is touching the curb. It, it and the, the red line is where? On the curb? Yes, the red line oops, is on the top of the curb. Well, and like Mars said, if the ball is touching that red line, it's considered to be part of the, it's in the penalty area. 
Yeah, that's what I thought. And you would not be allowed to get uh, free release. Right. Okay. All right. If, if if the ball is wedged though, like below, like on the car path, but not actually touching that red line, I think maybe that's the question that you're trying to get, or that that's probably the more realistic scenario. Right. It's down on the car path, touching the curb, and the top of the curb has the red line. Yeah. So yeah, then, in that case, then I would think, that, yeah, you would be able to get relief from an obstruction because you would not be considered to be part of the uh, penalty area. So whatever. You know, whatever area you would go, you know, not closer to the hole would be your relief area. Your nearest point of relief. But the line goes up and down. Craig, this is Inez. Go ahead, Inez. Craig, under the, in the definitions under penalty area, um, it's at the bottom. It says law under lines when defined by a painted line on the ground, the edge of the penalty area is the outside edge of the line. And the line itself is in the penalty area. Correct. Yes. Correct. So my guess would be that if they intended for the ball resting against the curb to be in the penalty area, they would paint the line in a different spot. By painting it on top of the curb, yes. what they're trying to imply is, is that, that from that point towards the has towards the penalty area is in. And if you're laying on the car path, you're out. So um, okay. if they wanted it to be in the penalty area when touching the red line, they would paint the red line all the way down onto the cart path. Yeah, I, I think that's that's the right assessment there. And then Lori, I think we talked about this before, but- you Yeah, know, I just wanted to share it with everyone because it's an interesting situation. Okay, can you hear me? Lord. Craig, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. The line is in the wrong spot. It's painted wrong. I think we're wasting too much time on it. The actual spot for that line should be inside the cart path. We would never paint a line like that. Okay. Okay. Well, good good discussion on that situation, Lori. Let's move on to. Okay. Any, any other questions on that? Craig on putting greens. I'm sorry. Go ahead. What? On uh, putting greens, just to confirm, uh, the fringe is not considered part of the putting green. Is considered part okay. of the general area. What is, is it? Fringe is in the general area. Fringe is in the general area. You need to be on the putting. The balls need to be touching the putting defined putting area in order to be considered uh, on the putting green. Correct. Okay. Now we talked about playing the course where the ball lies, but there are certain uh, parts of the course where a player can get uh, relief. Um, and those also have certain rules that are associated with them. Um, I'm not gonna go over in, in great detail. We'll talk about those in, in later on, uh, but I do wanna talk about abnormal course conditions, uh, define those as, uh, which are animal holes, run under repair, immovable obstructions and temporary water. Um, just be aware that those situations are gonna be granted relief and players are not uh, required to play from there. They have the choice of playing from there or not. Uh, but there are no free boundary, there, are, there is no free relief from boundary objects or integral objects that we would define on, for that, uh, for that uh, tournament. We would define integral objects. It's in our hard card and also anything specifically we'd have uh, defined integral objects on our notice to competitors on the front page where the whole locations are. Uh, so that 2.3 covers those condi conditions that can interfere with play and relief is granted uh, with no penalty. Uh, 2.4 is another area where it, uh, it can or cannot, it may or may not allow free relief. A penalty area is defined as part of an abnormal course condition or a penalty area, which play is not allowed. So if a, if a, play, if a no play zone is part of an abnormal ground condition, uh, a player would be granted free relief. But if a no play zone is part of a uh, penalty area and mandatory relief is required, the player will be assessed a one stroke penalty uh, in order to get free relief, in order to get relief from that no play zone coinciding with within the penalty area. Uh, and we had questions about that last year. We, uh, 
Any, any, any discussion on that? Are we clear on that or how that, how that, how you proceed on that? For example, at Midland Country Club, they've got a par three there with a, behind a hole, there is a putting green, I mean, a, a flower bed uh, behind a putting green uh, um, within, uh, and it's, an, it's a no play zone within a penalty area. They've got, a, they've got a marked off as a penalty area. So that area in itself, a player is not allowed to take free relief a one stroke penalty would be required, must be required, will be, will be assessed because the ball cannot be played from there and it must be taken out. Okay, are we clear on that? Um, we've got some time. I'm gonna go over the definition of abnormal ground conditions before we, before we go into the, uh, take a rules quiz. Hey, hey, Craig. Yeah, Kyle, go ahead. Really quick. So, so just on the on the no play zone too. Can you? So the, there there are, there could be situations too where where we might not want people to go in there at all. Um, or I mean, we're, we're we're also talking about the players' stance as well, right? Like if the ball is outside. What I guess so the question is what what happens if the ball is outside, but the players' stance would be in a flower bed? How would how would we handle that scenario? Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Kyle. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't uh, probably uh, clearly state what has to happen there. When, when it's not just the ball lies in the in the no play zone. If you look at the definition of a no play zone, that's also defined. It's part of the course we talked about. It must be in, in, in either an abnormal course condition or penalty area. So that's the reason why they, they are used is to protect wildlife and other such things. Hey, Craig, the, the language in 2.4 answers that question. John, is that John? Yeah, the language in 2.4, you could call it up. It says that exactly. It tells you the answer. I'm having a hard time hearing John. Can someone repeat what John said? Um, if you're if you're saying okay. no, look ball, look in look taken. in rule two point four. All right, John. John. So do you, do you want to walk through an example where the player's stance is in the no the, the no play zone and, and how they take relief from that so that they're not in there? Could could you walk us through that? Well, I mean, so, so the wording of the rule says uh, a player must take relief when a no play zone interferes with his or her area of intended stance or area of intended swing in playing a ball outside a no play zone. So if okay. it's, if it's not a penalty area, you proceed, you know, you find the nearest point uh, where the no play zone doesn't interfere with those things. And then you- Jack, can you get closer to your mic because I'm having a hard time hearing. Can anybody else, everybody else hear John? I can hear him fine, yes. Craig. I yeah. hear him fine. Okay. Um, I, if you look at 2-4 and the second bullet point under that, it talks about no play zone interferes with a player's area of intended stance or area of intended swing in playing a ball outside of no play zone. That ball is to be, that ball play is not allowed from that, that position of the ball. It's defined to be in that relief must be granted, it must be taken. If your swing, if your stance or area of intended swing interferes with that no play zone. So if you've got some high grass growing out of that no play zone and a player's swing is going to interfere with that high grass that is growing within the no play zone, a player must take relief, free relief in that situation, or otherwise the player would be considered to be playing from the wrong place and, and a penalty would be assessed. Is that, is that what you're saying, John? That's what the rule is saying, yes. Any questions on that then? I might just have one comment on that. <clears throat> Check rule 17, if the no play zone is in a penalty area and it's just stance and swing that are interfered with, you can take free relief in the penalty area in that case for your stance and swing or you can take penalty relief. That's the one time you can take free relief within the penalty area. 
Uh, that's a good point. Okay, thanks for bringing pointing it out. Yeah, as long as you if you drop the ball within the penalty area, um, what let's Liz, what uh, what what ball? Seven. It's seventeen uh, one, I believe. Give me one second. I'll give you a page number. Awesome. 248. 248. 248. And in rule 16.1, rule 16.1F, as in Frank. There's another reference there. It's on 248. When what, uh, what section of that page is it in? It's on seventeen one E two. Okay. Yeah, the second bullet point there talks about take free relief by dropping the original ball or another ball in this relief area, if it exists in the penalty area. So I guess you know there, there is that situation where you can take free relief and drop within that same penalty area as long as you remain in the penalty area. That's only if it interferes with stance and swing. Um, okay. If your ball is in the no play zone, you must take penalty relief. So a ball, yeah, a ball in the penalty area, but outside the no play zone. And, and the no play zone interferes with your stance or swing. Okay. You must either take those two options, take relief outside the penalty area under 17-1 or two, or take free relief by dropping an original ball or another ball in the relief area. The reference point is the nearest point of complete relief from the no play zone, and the size is one club length. It must not be near the hole. Okay, I'm go gonna go over the abnormal course conditions definitions. There are four abnormal course conditions, animal hole, ground under repair, removal of obstruction and temporary water. Um, animal hole has been expanded uh, this in this latest set of rules, which I think is good because no one ever understood what an animal was before. Now it's considered just about any animal. Uh, it includes uh, loose material that the animal has dug out of the hole. It includes a worn down track or trail leading into the hole in any area of the ground pushed up or altered as a result of the animal digging the hole underground. Um, an animal, you could also have an animal hole within a bunker and you'd get uh, you would get relief from an animal hole within the bunker. Uh, the ground under repair definition. Um, That up. It's that part of the course the committee has defined to be ground and repair. Uh, this is an area where as volunteers, as uh, rules officials, we need to be more or less a scout when you first you know get to your trouble hole and look for those areas of the course that the committee may want to know about to mark as run and repair that has not been previously marked. Uh, you especially want to focus on areas, uh, landing areas of that hole or uh, areas around the putting green or around buckers. Um, you certainly don't want to consider marking a, an area deep in the woods as ground under repair. But it's any part of the course that the committee has, has defined and it's all ground inside that edge of the defined area. Uh, any grass, bush, or tree growing within the area is considered part of that. 
in any parts of that object that extends up and above and even outside the edge of the defined area is still considered to be part of ground under repair. So if you've got a tree that is growing within the ground under repair and that tree, a tree grows up and extends outward beyond the boundary of the ground under repair, any branch that may interfere with a player's swing, uh, that player would be entitled to relief for ground under repair. There are certain rules, there are certain ground under repair situations that even if the committee does not define them, such as holes made by the committee or maintenance staff, uh, people how, it, how setting up the course, such as a hole where a stake has been removed, um, or maintaining the course where uh, a hole is made by removing a turf or tree stump that is defined to be ground under repair, but aeration holes are not considered ground under repair. Uh, grass cuttings, leaves, and other materials piled for later removal are either can be considered ground under repair or they could also be considered loose impediments. So materials left on the course piled up, say, outside in a wooded area that are not intended to be removed are not ground under repair unless the committee has defined them as such. Now, if you've got an animal habitat that uh, is going to be endangered by a player's stroke, uh, we, we'd want that to be, def by definition, that would be considered um, uh, a ground under repair. GAM uh, defines ground, ground and repair in different ways. They could define it by its physical characteristics or they can define it by uh, stakes, by, by lines, um, any number of ways, as long as it's clear to the players how we've defined ground and repair. Uh, just, be, just be aware of how it's defined and, and, and how relief would be granted. Uh, relief is not required. It's optional to the player whether or not they take relief from a ground and repair. Any questions on ground and repair? Um, there's a, uh, talks about, there's an interpretation that you may want to be aware of that normally tire ruts, if it's a deep rut, you want to grant uh, ground and, uh, relief for ground and repair. But by definition in itself, a tire rut is not uh, Run under repair. I think there's a clear. I think there's interpretation under that definition. Yeah, Craig, that's it's on page three three thirty seven. And I think the other thing. Can, uh, interpretation number one. Yeah, damage caused by committee and maintenance staff is not always ground under repair. It's going to be. Uh, um, it's going to be defined. It's got to be defined by the committee, and hopefully, we you know hopefully we would define these things um, prior to play moving through a particular hole. It's certainly it's certainly really hard to define an area as ground under repair once you know play has moved through a uh, particular area of a course, unless unless we've had a, a trouble a trouble hole person you know present the entire day and and knows for a fact that no other player has been. Um, in that in that area and, and would have been affected by it, but it's it's pretty almost impossible to define an area as ground under repair once play has moved through an area uh, through a hole. Um, one 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 noted one noted difference between stroke play and match play. As a rules official, uh, you have the authority to define an area as ground under repair for a match. Since you are the since if you are assigned to a match. You need to be assigned to it, but you can. You have that authority to uh, uh, define, you know, give give player a relief for abnormal ground condition, uh, if you de if you deemed that area to be such that it, uh, you know it's unfair to, for the player to play from, and uh, Gary Edelman can attest to that 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 is uh, true. Yeah, Craig, I, I think too. Just to add to that, so in stroke play. It, we, we don't we don't have our official or our referees um, you know they, they don't they don't have the authority to grant ground under repair that needs to be a decision made with the with the rover and the uh, staff there um, it's it's not something that that you have 
the uh, unilateral authority and stroke play because there are other considerations that you mentioned, Craig, uh, wh wh why that's the case. That is, that's correct, Kyle, thanks. Um, immovable destruction is pretty clear cut. I'll let you look at that on your own. Um, I put a question, this is Joe Bolter. I put a question on the uh, chat there about uh, straddling a uh, ground under repair. There was a uh, erosion um, area around the green at the meadows and it was marked uh, as ground under repair with about a one, it was about one foot wide. In this case, a left-handed player try, wanted to straddle it, take relief, and then straddle that in order to play their next shot. Uh, I said I think it's correct that they, you, you have to take complete relief and can't straddle the, the area. But it was an, it was an interesting uh, discussion with the player, and then later the player's coach and parent uh, who thought it was a wrong ruling, but I think it was correct. So the answer to that question, Joe, is no. Can you straddle an area marked as ground and repair to play your next stroke if you've taken relief from GOR? Um, yes. You know, the normal stroke is, uh, I mean, your normal stance is required to determine whether or not you have interference from any um, relief situation. So in this case, you'd also need to assume your normal stance to determine whether or not you've taken uh, proper relief from the ground under repair. Well, in this case, the player could take a normal stance. It's just that they straddled the ground under repair. And I said to them, if you take that relief, you can't straddle that. You have to take a stance that doesn't involve the ground under repair. Correct. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So the definition of immovable obstruction quickly, I guess, uh, it's any obstruction that cannot be moved without unreasonable effort or without damaging the obstruction on the course and otherwise does not meet the definition of movable, movable obstruction. The committee may define any obstruction to be immovable obstruction, even if it meets the definition of movables. So, you know, if we, if we don't want players to move certain things around, uh, we can define objects as immovable as by the committee. Okay, any questions on that? Uh, temporary water definition, we'll quickly just cover that. Um, it's temporary water is a temporary accumulation of water on the surface that normally is not going to be there uh, under normal, say, normal weather conditions. It's not, it's not in a penalty area. It's, it cannot be in a penalty area. Um, it, can, it can be seen before or after the player takes a stance without pressing down excessively with his or her feet. That's pretty, um, oftentimes we'll see players trying to generate temporary water situation by, you know, uh, you know shifting their weight back and forth. Uh, we have to be careful in how we allow players to do that. You should instruct the player just to approach the ball, take their normal, normal stance, uh, and and to see. And you can be the judge to see whether or not water um, is raised up by the player taking just their normal stance. It's not enough to uh, the ground to be merely merely wet, um, or for the water to be momentarily visible as the player steps on the ground. It must remain present either before or after the stance is taken. Okay, dew and frost are not temporary water. Uh, you cannot, you know, you cannot affect those. You cannot, uh, you know, you can't mess with dew and frost except in the teeing area. Um, snow and natural ice 
are either temporary water or they can be loose impediments depending upon at the player's option. Okay, manufactured ice is not temporary water, it's an obstruction. Any questions on temporary water? I know we see a lot of players trying to generate situations where they're gonna be getting relief from temporary water, but in effect, uh, um, they're just, you know, pressing, they're taking an, an abnormal stance trying to, trying to generate temporary water. Questions? All right, I think that wraps up uh, rule two. I'm not gonna go any further. Let's go to a USJ uh, um, rules quiz. I suggest uh, that all the volunteers, all, all of our rules officials, should try to take a rules quiz every day if they can, just a short one. Uh, you can do an interactive one, uh, pretty simple to do. Uh, you can choose the number of questions you wanna take, depending on how much time you have. Um, it's a good learning process. So we'll choose, uh, we'll choose 10 questions. Or you wanna do more, you wanna do more than 10, you wanna do, let's do just do 10. And we'll choose intermediate level and we'll work through these together. Okay, the first question, if a player purposely alters the line of play of another player, he or she is disqualified. The, the floor is open for votes. Comments, true or false? True. False. True. I would guess that it's the general. A lot of, lot of uh, true. Need need more input than just three. Keep, keep going. We got we got a couple of trues and one false. True. I'm hearing some trues. False. 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 Okay, I'm hearing. Oh, let's just go with false and see what we what we get. And we'll review these answers as we uh, submit our submit our answers. When dropping a ball, second question, when dropping a ball in the relief area under a rule, the player must let go of the ball from a location at knee height so that the ball does not touch any part of the player's body or equipment before it hits the ground. True or false? True. 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 A lot of true. true. We don't have too much time on that. That seems to be pretty, be a lot of consensus on true being the answer to number two. The third question, in a team competition, the committee may adopt a local rule allowing each team to name two advice givers. True or false? True. 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 Out of trues, anybody uh, wanna argue the true? Uh... Okay, we'll go with true. Number four, in stroke play. A, by mistake, gives wrong score to B, causing the player to lift his or her ball from the putting green without marking it. A gets a penalty. True or false? False. 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 Anybody say true? Nope. Okay, we're going with false. The fifth question, which is correct regarding the unreasonable delay of play, rule 5.6a? Player must, un, must not unreasonably delay play when playing a hole or between holes, which is correct. When a player unreasonably delays play between holes, the penalty applies to the last hole. And the third option, the penalty for a breach of the rule is disqualification. Which one of these is correct? The first, first one. Number one, a player. Number one. Reasonable. First one? One. one. Yeah. Yeah. First one. 
The sixth question, in the rain, a player holds an umbrella over his or her head with one hand while holding a short putt with his or her putter held in the other hand. There is no penalty, true or false? True. False. True. False. True. 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 I'm, hearing the, I'm hearing the truths talk louder than the falses. <laughs> true. True, we're going with true? True. Does the false person want to? Okay, we'll go with true. Seventh question. In the general area, a player makes a practice swing and accidentally moves his or her ball in play with his or her club. The player has not made a stroke and gets no penalty. False. 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 Everybody agree on false? Yeah. False. Yeah. That were on the teeing ground, that'd be a lot different, right? Yes. Yes. In stroke play, a player is disqualified from a primary, primarily handicapped competition for returning a scorecard with a no handicap shown. He or she may still receive a gross prize. True or false? True. 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 Yeah, mostly trues. If more than one player plays a provisional ball or another ball from the teeing area, the order of play is the same order as before. Ball. If more than one player plays a provisional ball or another from the teeing area, the order of play is the same as before. True. Oh, true. 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 Okay. Before the stroke with an unintended flag stick in the hole, the player may leave the flag stick as he or she finds it in the hole or center the flag stick in the hole. True. 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 Okay, a lot of, a lot of true and falses in that, in that quiz. <laughs> See what we got, how many we get? That'd be all of them. <laughs> okay, you guys are so terrific. All done, team. Uh, does anybody, want to, anybody have a discussion, one they want to talk about? There was some... Um, Let's talk about number one, because there was some discussion about that. Let's talk about A3. Let's go to A3 and look at that. Just to... I think the trick here is the level of penalty. There is a penalty, but it's not disqualification. Yeah, because you can't prohibit, you can't uh, affect the other, you can't, rule A3 covers what you can deliberate action the player can take to affect conditions for the other player. Um, but again, eight, the penalty for breach of rule A3 is general penalty. Good point. Um, any other, does anybody else want to discuss any other of the questions? How about the umbrella while putting? I'm sorry, which one? The umbrella while putting. I don't think you can hold one. You can't let anybody else yeah, hold the, one uh, the, for you. The umbrella? You can hold it yourself. Okay, rule 10 to be five. Let's just go to that and real quick and look at the uh, ruling on the, uh, what's allowed holding, the, holding an umbrella. Hey, hey Craig. Yeah. This is Barry. Um, uh, I'm in the rules class this week and that whole concept actually came up last night. Um, Chip Essig's uh, PGA guy was talking about it. And the question that really came up was whether or not a player using a, a pull cart, a trolley, that has um, a stand for the umbrella, whether or not they could use the, you know, umbrella to block rain if it was blowing at them. And so they went through that whole thing. So it was an interesting discussion, but the fact of the matter is that both the USGA and the PGA guy agreed that if you can hold the umbrella, you can do that and make that short putt. And, you know, that's not an issue, but nobody else can. And if you can't leave it on your cart, you know, and make a shot with the umbrella blocking and all the rest of that. so. I think that's what we're going to find here. Okay, so yeah, Barry, it's uh, it's covered under two B five. Two B uh, number five, um, physical help and protection from elements. While getting physical help from his or her caddy or any other person, uh, with his or her caddy, any other person or objects deliberately positioned uh, gives protection. That player must not make a stroke uh, while the, the, those things are occurring. So you cannot make a stroke getting physical help from your caddy to protect yourself from the elements. 
but does not prohibit the player from taking his or her own actions to protect against the elements while making a stroke, such as by wearing protective clothing or holding an umbrella over his or her head. So if you can make a one-handed swing with your golf club while holding an umbrella, you can do that too. Yep. As well as, uh, as, well as holding, holding a putt, correct. But it, it, okay. it made it clear though you could not position your cart with that umbrella there to block the rain or the elements, right? Correct. Yeah, okay. Um, what if what if someone what, what if you're not driving the cart and you're sitting there waiting to play and your uh, the person you're sharing the cart uh, drives up uh, with that and uh, parks it such where the umbrella does help you? Can you can you uh, have him leave it there? Say no. Hmm. <clears throat> Golf is a game of honor. <laughs> <laughs> I probably well, wouldn't ask him to move. If it's kind of a player did it yeah, I think it would depend on whether player yeah, could, called the guy over to park it in a deliberate spot. But yeah, I could just hear these guys this afternoon with that kind of question going. Well, let's see. You know, no, I I think you'd have to ask him to move. You know, right. he may I don't not think know you what would have to. I mean, there are certain there are certain actions where you know you get the benefit of someone leaving something on the ground, say on the putting green. Right. Um, but if you read the like loose pediment or something, or something gets left on the putting green, it's going to assist you. But putting putting green's different. You have to move it. Right. If you read the wording in ten two b five, it says with something in that position. It doesn't say you put it there or somebody else put it there. You can't make a stroke with something left in a position to benefit you. Is there a difference between but the, it being placed there to help you or it just so happening to be there in a way that may help you? Well, it says with an object deliberately positioned to give protection. It doesn't say that you did it or somebody else did it. I guess the, yeah, the question becomes deliberately or not. That's always, uh, it's always gonna be like a subjective uh, interpretation. In any case, I'm going to give you some of your time back. Um, next week, we're going to cover rules three and four. And then you get uh, uh, Professor Jewett back for uh, the following week. Or uh, he's going to cover rules five and six, I believe. Excuse me. I wanted to get clarification on the advice givers in team competitions. What, what was that? Uh, it was like the eighth. Uh, the okay, let's find that and go to that. That, that question was that. Number three. Number three. Okay, we've got to go to uh, model local rule H2. You'll be on page 500 in your big book. It talks about the appointment of an advice giver. So a committee can make a local rule, basically what it's saying. And it says you can name one or two people to give advice to the team members. Now, there are some restrictions on that too, you've gotta to be aware of, that the advice giver cannot be, uh, he cannot be a player, he must be identified before the, before the committee uh, starts, must be identified to the committee. The committee can limit the types of advice that person may give. Uh, the committee can prohibit an advice giver from walking on certain parts of the course. Craig, that's like the situation where Tiger was, was it the President's Cup or the Ryder Cup, where he was a player and he was the captain both? But after he was done playing, he could give advice. Okay, you're saying that, what, no, say that again, Dan. Tiger... Tiger Woods was the captain of either the Ryder Cup or the President's yes. Cup here, the last one. Yeah. He yeah. couldn't give advice while he was playing, but once he was done, that's where I think this comes in, where they gave him the ability to be able to give advice after he was done playing his round. As an, advice As an example. Restriction on where it says that. Where it says the advice giver cannot be a player during the round during his or her round. Right, so he couldn't do it during his round, but once he was done with his round, he could then 
be back as the captain and giving advice. Okay, that's correct, yeah. Hey, Craig, I think yeah. they, so, so typically in a like Ryder Cup scenario, there's only one captain that will give advice. And so I think in what Dan was mentioned is that the, there, there was an assistant captain or someone giving advice while Tiger was playing. And then when he, when he's done, he transitioned. But for this, for this question about two advice givers, that's very common at the college level where you'll see the coach and the assistant coach being able to give advice. And that's a common um, rule that, they, that, that, that the NCAA puts in play. Now, now Mick, in high school, uh, high school restricts only the coach giving advice. Do they have that limited number to one person or two pe person, do you know? In high, in high school MHSA? Is Mick still on the call? Okay. Craig, I believe I, it's just one. Is it just one in high school, I believe? Yeah, I think it's just the head coach. Yeah. Not even the, the assistant. Coach, yeah. yeah. We not are, the assistants. It, no, they can designate an advice giver. Doesn't have to be the head coach, as long as you designate the person. As long as it's doesn't, okay. Right, and I think I think they they don't allow the coaches on the green. Is that right? I believe that's that. correct. Correct. That's, that's correct. correct. Yeah. All right, everyone. I want to thank you for your time today. Have good a good work. Good week. Stay stay healthy. Hey, hey Craig. Yeah. Thank you. Before you drop yeah. off, I have, I have one question on temporary water. I think. Okay. It's how I read the definition. A temporary accumulation of water on the surface of the ground, such as puddles or rain, and overflow from a body of water that is not in a penalty area. So if there's a penalty area and it overflows, okay, mm -hmm. is that yeah. water that's outside the red or the yellow line temporary water or not? Yes, yes that's temporary water overflowing, the, yes. So it's not the water from the penalty area, it's the water outside of it, regardless of where it came from. Correct. That's why in those cases, a lot of times we show when we've got a lot of uh, an area of the course where that situation exists, where we have um, temporary water that exists outside the penalty area of a, of a, a body of water, uh, we need to know precisely where that ball uh, landed in order for to determine the if uh, a ruling to a player, whether or not that player is going to be given free relief from temporary water or whether or not that player is going to be having to take a one stroke penalty to get take relief from the penalty area itself. But the water okay. at the red line. Okay. Hit or temporary water. Yes. Okay. I, I just, that, that was my interpretation, but as I was reading it, I got to thinking about it because Lonsway and I, um, a year ago, a year and a half ago, we're doing a girls tournament at uh, Winston Novi. And we had a situation where it had, it rained a lot the day before, and there was a situation like that, and he and I had talked about it. That was my understanding. I just want, like I said, you start reading some of these definitions, and you go, well, wait a minute, what does that really say? You know, so thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Craig. Thanks, Craig. Yep. Thanks, thanks, Craig. Great job. Thank you. See you all next week. All right.